Right? So we get to that point when we don't have any more life, when the liberty and freedom that has been given to us is no longer there. Right? And so after that point, then we move forward in eternity according to the way we lived. Después de este punto de la muerte, nosotros tenemos que entrar en la eternidad, en la manera, según los méritos que hemos este, experimentado en esta vida. Right? Whether they were good or bad, we have to live in eternity according to the merits or lack of merit of what we did. So, at the time in Catholicism, so here's a big question, especially for those of us who live in the deep south. So what happens to our soul after death? Right? Una ¿Qué pasa con nuestro alma después de la muerte? So a lot of our separated brothers and sisters, okay, we said, you know, non-Catholic Christians, there's a very strong idea of something called the rapture, right? Que tenemos esta idea de, de, de rapture, de los últimos días, de, de un juicio final. And like we've learned in so many of our classes, in Catholicism, we're a lot both and. It's never really either or. The, the, the universal church teaches us that there will be one day a final judgment. Right? Que un día vamos a experimentar un juicio final cuando todas las almas van a estar llamadas delante del Señor y Él va a dar su juicio final. All the souls living in there at a certain moment will be called before the Lord on the last day and will receive a final judgment. But in Catholicism, we also believe in the particular judgment that at the death of every individual, que en la muerte de cada persona individual, también hay un juicio particular para esta persona. Right, so in that moment of our death, God is going to make a judgment. So let's look here. That each person will be judged immediately on their death based on the merits of his or her life. And so there's three things that can be judged. Immediate entrance into heaven. Purification that leads to entrance to heaven. Or immediate and everlasting damnation. Entonces son tres cosas. En el juicio particular, nosotros, según los méritos de nuestra vida, vamos a recibir una entrada inmediata a la bienaventuranza del cielo o la purificación que conduce a la entrada del cielo, que es el purgatorio, o la condenación inmediata y eterna. So, these are the three 
things that are judgments for us. And let's talk about that. Let's start with a good one. Let's talk about that. A mí me gusta hablar del cielo porque es mi trabajo. Like this is, I like to talk about heaven because that's my job. It's my job to get people into heaven. You know, I can't go through the world trying to put people in hell. That's not my job. Que, que enviar personas para el de mandar personas al infierno no es mi trabajo ni mi des, ni, ni, ni deseo. So, entonces, a mí me gusta hablar del cielo, right? So, here's some beautiful words. Those who die in God's grace and friendship. A mí me gusta eso, eso es muy precioso para mí. Los que mueren en la gracia de Dios y en su amistad. Right? This is a, a beautiful concept to die in His grace and friendship. To be God's friend. Ser un amigo de Dios. Uno de sus amigos. Uno de sus compañeros. En el camino. ¿no? Así fue Jesús. Caminando con los discípulos a Emmaus. ¿no? That's how Jesus walked with the disciples on the way to Emmaus. And He revealed Himself in this conversation. They wanted Him to stay with them in they had made friends with Jesus along the way. And so, this is how we're supposed to die. Right? We're supposed to live our lives like this. Vivir como amigos de Dios y morir como amigos de Dios. Like, to live and die as the friends of God. Right? And when we die like that, then we go to heaven. It's not complicated, and it's not hard. Que no es complicado, ni es difícil. Mucha gente piensa que, ay, mire, tanta perfección. Mire, deje que el Señor haga su trabajo. Let God do what he needs to do with you. Let his grace work in you. He, he does this work. Like, he does this work. This is the mystery of the cross. He has done the great part of getting us to heaven already. It's only for us to be his friends and cooperate. And he will bring us to heaven. Not complicated. No está complicado eso. But we complicate. Nosotros hacemos muchas complicaciones. Nosotros. Pero para Dios no es complicado. And so when we get to heaven, right, here's what heaven is going to be. Like a lot of people say, oh, God, I think heaven is going to be boring. La gente me dice, ay padre, el cielo es aburrido. Los ángeles cantando, mira para la eternidad, ay mira este ruido. Like it's a lot of just play on harps and I don't like harps. <laughs> you know, no, people say this all the time. But let's look at what we get when we get to heaven. Que miramos lo que recibimos en el cielo. Nosotros tenemos la vida de duranza, de una, un perfecto conocimiento, Amor y gozo. We have the blessedness in heaven of perfect knowledge, love, and joy. Perfect knowledge, love, and joy. Those are the three words you have to remember always that heaven is perfect knowledge, perfect love, and perfect joy. So many people say, Father, will I know my mama when I get to heaven? La gente me pregunta a mi padre. Voy a conocer a mi mamá en el cielo. Voy a conocer a mi esposo, mi esposa. Like, well, I know my wife, well, I know my husband, well, I see my children, well, I see my grandmother, well, I see, even people say, well, I see my dog. I'm not getting into the argument of whether or not there's no dogs in heaven. <laughs> I got in an argument one time with my sister. She remembers it to this day. Because, you know, when you go to the seminary, you learn all kinds of stuff and you feel all important. <laughs> There's, there's a theologian that says that because animals don't recognize their creator, that they can't go to heaven, right? And so my sister was like, you're saying that all dogs go to hell. And I'm like, no, I'm not saying that. Anyway, she remembers that to this day. That's why you have siblings, to keep you honest. Pero si, vamos a tener conocimiento perfecto. Like, we're going to have perfect knowledge. So whatever it takes for you to have perfect knowledge, it's going to happen. 
And having perfect knowledge means that so many things that in this world confuse us, don't confuse us. No confusion in heaven. Que en el cielo no hay confusión. No existe. Mira, tanta cosa fea que pasa en este mundo por la confusión humana. Right? Hay mucha confusión. But since there's no confusion in heaven, this is a great gift. Um, there's an ancient phrase that I mentioned before, but it's such an important phrase for us to remember, that he who understands more, pardons more. Que, que entiende más, o comprende más, perdona más. So in heaven, we're not bothered by things because we see things as God sees them. That's why God is so patient with us because he sees beyond our weakness. He sees beyond our, our problems and our confusion. And then in heaven there's perfect love. Hay un amor perfecto también en el cielo. Un amor perfecto. Our love is limited in this world. We put limits all the time. Humans are very good at measuring, right? El humano es muy bueno en medir. Like we, we calculate everything, right? We calculate how much, how little, how far, how fast. God does not care. Because he is all powerful. Everything is his. Why would he measure it? Porque Dios no quiere medir nada. Todo es suyo. Entonces no tiene necesidad de medir un pedacito, de con unos centavitos dar un dinerito. Dios no, no está calculando nada. Para Él todo es todo. So we have perfect love. We don't limit anything in heaven. And then perfect joy. El gozo perfecto. Like in this world, we experience joy. That's a beautiful thing, that we can experience joy. But a lot of times, the things that we think will make us happy, in the end, don't make us happy. Because they're imperfect joys. They're limited joys. Que muchas veces, nosotros sí, en este mundo experimentamos gozo. Pero a veces es un gozo limitado, un gozo que no a veces tiene los resultados que queremos nosotros. Los resultados no nos traen una alegría, un gozo perfecto. Es un gozo imperfecto, un gozo instantáneo que luego no es lo que esperamos. And so we have to understand that in heaven, the joy that we experience is more than we could ever imagine. And that's what Paul tells us. We turn the page. Okay, so Paulo nos dice, Paul tells us, no eye is seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man can see what God has prepared for those who love him, for those who are his friends. Que dice, Que ningún ojo vio, ni oído oyó, ni el corazón del hombre ha concebido lo que Dios ha preparado para los que lo aman. Right? So we have no idea what he's preparing for us. And that's why we want to go to heaven. And so there was also a question too about whether or not once you got to heaven, you could be thrown out. And I don't know how many of you have ever had that question. But people in history have had that question. Que la pregunta de que cuando ya alcanzamos el cielo, el Señor nos va a votar también. Si nosotros no nos comportamos bien en el cielo, nos va a votar. Is God going to throw us out of an act right in heaven? But no, once we are in heaven, it is in time. We never thrown out of heaven because of the reasons that I mentioned, because we have perfect knowledge, perfect love. Apart, talking about heaven, we can't fail to talk about an important part of getting to heaven, which is uh, about being pure. 
this idea of being pure. Entonces, hablando del cielo, hay que hablar de una parte importante que es eh, la idea de ser puro para entrar en el cielo. So, like, pure means that you don't have any sin. That's real plain. Que puro quiere decir que uno no tiene pecado. So, that's kind of hard. It's not impossible. But it can be a little hard. So, God has some options now. Because we can't be with Him. We can't be in His purity, in His perfect life, if we are worthless. Que nosotros no podemos estar en su divina presencia, su presencia pura y perfecta, si te la mancha. Because guess what? Whatever is stained, stains the things around it. The, like, you don't put your clean clothes in the dirty clothes hamper. Because guess what? They're not clean anymore. So you put your clean clothes in a clean place, don't you? Que nosotros ponemos la ropa limpia en un lugar limpio. Si tiramos allá la ropa limpia, ya juntado con la ropa sucia, resulta de que todo sucio. So, how do we get to this point? How does it happen? Because God can condemn us completely for any little sin that we have that affects our purity, or He can find a way, or make a way, better said, make a way for us to be with Him, rather than condemn us to hell for any impurity. And that is what in the Catholic Church we refer to as purgatory. Y como esta manera que Dios en su misericordia tiene para prepararnos para estar en su presencia pura, eso se llama el purgatorio. And all it means is that God has provided some way for us to purify our soul, to be with Him, rather than condemn us. Now, there's a lot of history and a lot of ideas about purgatory, but we don't really know a lot. What we do know is that it's simply part of a transition to heaven. Because I, I remember a priest told me one time, in fact, it was Father Bob, our big bad Father Bob, right? In West Pro Padre Bob, él me dijo en una ocasión que la única cosa que él quería es tener el, el dedo pequeño de su pie en purgatorio. Porque eso quiere decir que va a entrar en el cielo. Porque si tiene su so, el dedo de su pie en purgatorio, eventualmente todo, todo el ser va a estar en el cielo. So, Father Bob said, all he really is working for is to get his pinky toe in purgatory. <laughs> because if he can get that pinky toe in purgatory, he knows the whole rest of him is going to end up in, in heaven. Okay? And that's wonderful. Like, this is a beautiful idea. So, for instance, Purgatory, again, we don't know a whole lot about it. But remember that death is a door. Recordando que Dios es una, que, que, que la muerte es una puerta. So I'm going to have to go over here to the door, this little door, the physical door, because it's here. Okay? Okay, so I have a door. Tenemos aquí una puerta. So, Heaven is on the other side of this door. This is the world, right? On this side is the world, on the other side is heaven. En este lado tenemos el mundo, el otro lado está el cielo, supuestamente. So we want to come in, right? We, we, we're living, and so then we, we're, we're moving to this door, and then knocking on the door, we're about to die, right? Y ya estamos casi para morir. Entonces, tenemos que pasar Para pasar esta puerta, tenemos que morir. In order to go through this door, we have to die, right? And so I'm going to go through this door. And as I go through this door, now I'm in heaven. Que ahora 
play this yet. But this right here, this right part of this, this is what makes the door a door, right? Que esta parte que es el marco, eso es lo que hace la puerta una puerta, el marco. Este, este marco ya está como unos cuatro pulgadas de ancho. This is like a four inch wide, uh, this is the lid, right? This is the, this is the lintel of the door. It's about four inches wide. But this lintel is what makes me make a transition from this world into heaven, right? The lintel, like I have to cross over the threshold, right? So there's the, the lintel, there's the threshold, but that marks the transition. And if you have ever another kind of door, is we call it tunnel, right? Que otra, otra manera de puerta, nosotros podemos decir que es un túnel, right? A tunnel is a really long door, isn't it? it? You have to go a long way down a tunnel, right? And you start off at the back of the tunnel and it's dark. But the closer you get to the end, the closer you get to the light. And you just have to go through the tunnel. Some tunnels are long and some tunnels are short. El túnel es mucho más largo, pero es una transición de un lugar para el otro. It's all about a point of transition. And as one goes through that transition, one is purified. Because you're on your way and you desire God. Que uno está en camino y uno tiene el, el deseo, el anhelo para Dios. Y es este anhelo para Dios que purifica el alma. And it's that desire and love for God that purifies the soul in the transition. That's how it's, the soul is purified. Sometimes in history, you'll hear it referred to almost like the fires of purgatory. Right? And they're not like fires of punishment like hell. They're fires like you have a burning love. Que, 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 que a veces uno escucha, alguien dice como los fuegos, eh, las llamas del purgatorio, no son llamas de, del infierno, de castigo, son llamas de, de anhelo, de deseo, como el corazón ardiente, like a burning heart. That's what purgatory is. And in the scriptures, it's not, like people say, there's nothing in purgatory in the Bible, how can we have that? Que la gente dice que no hay nada en la escritura que habla de purgatorio. It's everywhere, y'all. The word purgatory is not in the Bible. But what is in the Bible, in almost every book of the Bible, is a very clear and overwhelming description of the characteristics of God's mercy. Pero lo que existe en la escritura, en casi todos los libros de las escrituras, Es una, un canto de la misericordia inmensa y perfecta de Dios. And purgatory is simply a manifestation of His love and mercy. So that we can be with Him. So that our imperfections don't hold us back. Because we try real hard. And He knows it. He wants us to be with Him. And He's not going to let the old devil his tricks keep us away from him. Now, we can, with our reason and with our will, nosotros con nuestra razón y con nuestra voluntad, nosotros podemos rechazar completamente a Dios y hay gente que lo hace. We can reject God completely and turn away from him completely. That is possible because he gave us freedom. Dios nos dio la libertad y nosotros tristemente podemos usar esta libertad para rechazarla, para negar su existencia y vivir una vida sin él. We can use that freedom that he's given us to reject him, to deny his existence, and to then live our lives without him. We can do that. But the result is that we take ourselves, we take ourselves out of His grace and His light. And this is what is a mortal sin. 
que en esto consiste el pecado mortal. Que yo, con mi libre voluntad, yo me tomo a mí, afuera de la gracia y la bendición de Dios y su vida divina. I take myself out. Like I said at the beginning, we're not in the business of hell. Que el, el infierno no es nuestro negocio, no estamos vendiendo el infierno. We are here to facilitate people going to heaven. And so for that reason, God gives us this beautiful gift of purgatory to purify our soul, to be with you. And so now we've got to talk about it. Ahora, hay que hablar del infierno. Que existe. Es existe. Sí, sí. Hell is real, y'all. You know. It's real. Now, there's like hellfire and brimstone preachers, right? That's a common thing. You see that all over there. But here's the thing. Hell is kind of a scare tactic. Que, que predicar sobre el infierno a veces es una táctica de miedo para que la gente se Okay, está bien, because it's real. It's okay. Hell is real, and you should be a little scared of that. But as a tactic to make people change their lives, it doesn't work. And it's never worked. Fear of hell does not get you to heaven. Remember, now we have to drag something up from an old class. Okay? Something very important. Que ahora tenemos que jalar algo de nuestra memoria a ponerlo al corriente de este día. Recuerda cuando hablamos sobre el sacramento de la reconciliación y hablamos sobre una oración como, que, que se llama el acto de contrición. Recuerda, we talked about, when we talked about the sacrament of reconciliation, we talked about this prayer called the act of contrition. And remember, we said that contrition is when you're sorry for your sins because you heard God, who you love. And that's better than just being scared of punishment. Right? Remember that? So, hell is real, and we should be scared of it, but it shouldn't be our motivator. It shouldn't, like, it shouldn't be the motivator of our lives. I just did, I don't know what, I didn't do that because I didn't go to hell. Okay, that's kind of okay, I guess. But our real sentiment should be that I did something because I wanted to be in heaven with God forever. I chose the good because I loved him, and I saw that I, he's my friend, and I wanted to love my friend with my life. I wanted to love my friend with my life. Entonces, la motivación de no hacer algo, porque yo no quiero este, estar en la eternidad en el infierno, bueno, esta motivación no es la motivación más horrible, pero tampoco no es la motivación más noble. Que más noble es desear el cielo y desear hacer cosas y vivir mi vida para amar a mi amigo, para recibir las bendiciones y vivir en compañía con mi amigo, que es Dios. Eso es mucho más importante. So, the word hell in English is a, like an Anglo-Saxon word. Que la palabra hell en inglés es una palabra que viene de los ingleses paganos de hace siglos y siglos y siglos. It's a German word too. Like there's a lot of, like, English and German have a lot of common words. Que el inglés y el, el, el alemán tienen muchas palabras en común. So, hell is a different concept, really, kind of, than what you find in the Bible. In the Bible, Jesus speaks of a place called Gehenna. En la Biblia, Jesús habla de un lugar que se llama Gehenna. Gehenna viene de la palabra hebrea, Get Hinnom. El Get Hinnom era una valle afuera de Jerusalén. So, the Hebrew word get hinom, it means the valley on the low end 
of the city of Jerusalem. So if you look at the map, if you look at a, if a, a picture of the city of Jerusalem, you see that the hill of Zion, que el monte Sion de la ciudad de Jerusalén, va esta colina, este monte, baja un poquito a un lado. And in the ancient days, guess what happened at the low side? That's where all the trash went. Right? Because when it rains, all the trash is going to run down, it's in the street, it's going to ultimately end up in the low end of the city. And that's where they have a gate called the Dome Gate. Okay? Okay, ya en Jerusalén, hay una, hay, ¿cómo se llama? Un puerto. Sí, un portal, digo. Tiene un portal en el muro de la ciudad. Y eso es el portal donde pasaba toda la basura. De hecho, fue llamado portal de basura. Okay? But on the, in the valley there, it's where all the trash was the dump. It was the dump of Jerusalem. And people used to light the trash on fire. And then, at a certain moment, you can read about this in the Bible. The people of God, the Hebrew people, felt like they were being punished by the gods of other people's religions. And they felt like they needed to offer human sacrifices to appease those gods. And they only could offer the sacrifice of a pure soul. So they went into the dome where all these fires were burning and they sacrificed children. Que en la historia antigua, que eso se puede leer en la Biblia, que el pueblo de Israel en un momento tenía miedo de que los dioses de otros, otras naciones estaban castigando al pueblo y para pacificar esos dioses, ellos tenían que ofrecer el sacrificio de un alma puro, entonces sacrificaron a niños vivos en este valle de Minó, donde había el fuego de toda la basura y todo eso. Entonces la imagen de, 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 de Gehenna era una imagen de fuego constante y acciones ajenas. So this was the idea of Gehenna was a place of constant fire and, and the suffering and terrible action. Right? So Jesus uses this image to describe what we call hell. Entonces Jesús usa este imagen para hablar de este lugar verdadero que existe, que es el infierno. But that's where the idea is. When Jesus says Gehenna, He's talking about hell, but that's the phrase that he used, so we know, so we understand. So, hell exists, but again, it's not our focus. But it can, the concept can help us understand the importance of conversion to Christ. And, um, like, I've only ever had one experience in my whole life as a priest. Because a lot, you know, the priest a lot of times comes to somebody with their, at the end of their life. Like, this is something that happens all the time for a priest, that he's called to go to someone at the end of their life. And at the end of people's lives, people believe in heaven and hell. No matter what they did their whole life. That's a different moment, right? <clears throat> que el trabajo del sacerdote es de ir allá a la persona en los últimos momentos de su vida y ayudarles a entender la importancia del cielo y claro, es muy cuando la mayoría de la gente en el último instante son muy ¿cómo se dice? receptivas son muy receptivos de, de la idea y entienden muchas cosas en los últimos instantes but there was just one occasion when I was asked to go, uh, and a lady, had, her husband, he had never been baptized, and he never had been, the lady had practiced her Catholic faith her whole life, very faithful to that, but her husband, he didn't have anything to do with it. And she thought maybe at the last minute that, you know, if the priest came, the priest could help her husband. But uh, that didn't work out. He, he, like, he told me to leave. He didn't want to have anything to do with me. He's like, or have anything to do with God. 
And that's what he said. I mean, what can you do? You know? And so, you know, you can't wrestle them. You know? You've got to have a choice in your heart. Right? So, you know, and, and, that, and that man wasn't there at that moment. At least that I said, maybe later he made up his mind for God. I don't know. But, um, but it can be that way. People can be stubborn. But we're here today because we're not stubborn. Que nosotros, nosotros, nosotros estamos hoy aquí porque nosotros no somos tecos. Queremos conocer a Dios. Queremos vivir en su amistad. Queremos hacer todo para estar con Él en el cielo. Entonces, nosotros no somos como este Señor que mencioné, que en el último instante de su vida, cuando llegó el sacerdote, para traer la gracia de Dios que mandó para afuera al sacerdote o a Jesús en el momento. Nosotros no somos así. Queremos vivir con Él y tenerlo en nuestras vidas. So, now we come back around a little bit to this idea of the last day. I mentioned earlier that at our death, at the moment of our death, we're going to have each one of us will be judged by Christ. Que en el momento de nuestra muerte, cada uno de nosotros, individualmente, el Señor nos va a dar juicio. Para el final de los tiempos, but at the end of all time, again, we don't know much about this, but we know that this day will come. At the end of all time, there will be a judgment for all the souls of the dead come before the Lord, and all the souls of the living will come before the Lord. And that judgment <clears throat> will reveal, again, will make plain all the good that righteous souls have done, and then all the evil that the condemned souls did, and the good that they did not do, and should have done. All that will be revealed again. And then Christ will seal everything in eternity. So that the souls of the just will all be with him in heaven, and the souls of those who weren't just will go be elsewhere for all eternity. Right? So and that is the last day. So you see, there's a little sort of a nice little diagram here. It makes a four. Que este, este, esta imagen que hace un cuatro hablando de las cuatro últimas cosas. Tenemos la muerte, el juicio particular. Si so, nosotros no tenemos pecado en el momento de la muerte, vamos directamente al cielo. Pero si tenemos nuestras imperfecciones, los pecados pequeños, Entonces vamos a estar purificados y vamos a estar en el cielo, ¿eh? que está aquí este, esta curva. Pero si morimos en el momento, ya estamos separados completamente de Dios, terminamos en este lugar más donde está funcionando muy bien la calefacción. Like this place where the heat is working real well. Right? That's where we end up. So this is the, the little idea that is the summary of what we, we talked about. But like I said, it's important for us to think about that. Every day, think about what it is that we really desire. Importante de pensar y meditar en el cielo todos los días. Que es que deseamos nuestro anhelo. What is it that we really want? And then make that our goal. To make heaven our goal. Para que el cielo esté nuestra mente y que no permitimos que nada ni nadie nos previene. We have to have that kind of resolve, right? Hay que tener la resolución de no permitir que nada ni nadie nos previene entrar en el cielo. That's just what we have to try and do every day in our bed. So, that's, uh, that's our four last things. So tonight, we are going to um, have just a little ceremony. We're going to listen to the Word of God a little bit. And then I'm going, we're going to hand out the creed to all of you who are going to come.
come into the church, and then we're going to pray the creed together. Okay, vamos a rezar este credo juntos. Okay, estas palabras son importantes. But um, um, but I'll save all that for just a little bit, and then I talk about the creed. And then next Tuesday, the 16th, que este martes que viene el 16, vamos a tener el ensayo para el sábado de gloria. So we're going to have our practice for Holy Saturday night next Tuesday at the same time. So we'll all be ready. Okay, and it'll be a lot of fun. We'll talk about the ceremony. Que vamos a hablar sobre la ceremonia y todo eso. And it's going to be nice. Okay? So, Ms. Kim, we're ready. Oh, yeah, that's right. She reminded me this Sunday at 11 is the second scrutiny for those of you who are going to be baptized. Is that right? So please stand. A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. Azariah stood up in the fire and prayed aloud. For your name's sake, O Lord, do not deliver us up forever, or make void your covenant. Do not take away your mercy from us. For the sake of Abraham, your beloved, Isaac, your servant, and Israel, your holy one, to whom you promised to multiply their offspring like the stars of heaven, are the sand on the shore of the sea. For we are reduced, O Lord, beyond any other nation, brought low everywhere in the world this day because of our sins. We have in our day no prince, prophet, or leader, no burnt offering, sacrifice, oblation, or incense, no place to offer first fruits to find any favor with you, but with contrite hearts and humble spirit, let us be received as though it were burnt offerings of rams and bullocks or thousands of fat lambs. So let our sacrifice be in your presence today as we follow you unreservedly. For those who trust in you cannot be put to shame. And now we follow you with our whole heart. We fear you and we pray to you. Do not let us be put to shame. But deal with us in your kindness and great mercy. Deliver us by your wonders and bring glory to your name, O Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The response is, remember your mercies, O Lord. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Your ways, O Lord, make known to me. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Remember that your compassion, O Lord, and your kindness are from of old. And your kindness remember me because of your goodness, O Lord. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Thus he shows sinners the way. He guides the humble to justice. He teaches the humble his way. According to Matthew, 
Peter approached Jesus and asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, his master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and all his property in payment of the debt. At that, the servant fell down, did him homage, and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized him and started to choke him, demanding, Pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had him put in prison until he had paid back the debt. Now when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly Father do to you, unless each of you forgive your brother from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. This Gospel in particular talks to us about what it means to live in communion, to forgive our brother or sister, to not let these things that could divide us, tear us apart. Because the servant for whom everything was forgiven, his grasping, his desire to just have everything, it destroyed, it destroyed him at the end of the day. Much better if he had had solidarity with the other servant. If he had realized that he was truly in the same boat. El primer siervo no realizó que estaba en la misma barca que su compañero. Que quisiera tirar el piloto de la barca. He wanted to throw the pilot out of the boat. Someone that was there ultimately to go with him the way to salvation, to experience good things together. And that's one of the reasons why on Sunday we profess a creed together. Que los domingos nosotros profesamos un credo juntos. We do this profession of faith that's the same for all of us. And it helps us always remain in the mindset of the fact that we share good things with everybody else that believes the same thing that we do. Que nosotros compartimos cosas maravillosas con todos los demás que tienen las mismas creencias de nosotros. That's why the creed is a precious thing. And we have a ceremony to give the creed to those who wish to be members of the Catholic Church. The words of the creed, every word is fought over. Every word had blood shed over it. So it's a precious thing. And so when we pronounce those words on Sunday, say, I believe, we'll say them here in just a minute together. Those are precious words because it puts us all in the same boat so that we know that we are to love our neighbor and to live in communion with every fiber of our being. And we'll pray together this Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made.
these elect of God, that God in his mercy may make them responsive to his love, so that through the waters of rebirth they may receive pardon for their sins, and through the sacrament of confirmation receive the seal of the Holy Spirit and have full life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Lord, eternal source of life, justice, and truth, Take under your tender care these your servants. Purify them and make them holy. Give them true knowledge, sure hope, and sound understanding. And make them worthy of the Easter sacraments they are preparing to receive. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.